Do not fear, for you will not be put to shame. You will not be ashamed, neither be disgraced, for you will not be put to shame. You can read this next part along with me. Exactly 365 times in the Bible, we are told not to be afraid. Fear is a powerful force used by the enemy to rob us of our passion, our joy, our peace. And the enemy uses fear to rob us of the pursuit of our best lives with God. Every day we must face and every day we must overcome. Did you hear what I said? Every day we must face fear, but every day you can overcome fear. I said every day you can overcome fear. I said every day you are an overcomer. Amen? This church is not going to be ruled by fear, by self-doubt, by worry, and by, by anxiety. Is all of that real? Yes. Does all of it need to be dealt with? Yes, but we are not going to be ruled by it. Amen? Remember, God has not given you a spirit of fear. And if God has not given you something, then you don't have to accept it. Fear is not going to hold us back, not in 2023 and not 10 or 15 years from now. Amen? Come on, let's pray this prayer together on the count of three. And remember... We are a praying church. We are a faith-filled church. Come boldly to the throne of grace. We, we don't apologetically pray. You know what I'm saying, right? Heavenly Father, I thank you that I'm victorious through Jesus Christ. No, no, no. We're, we're coming boldly with faith. Amen? Count of three. One, two, three. Come on. Rather, I will overcome it through faith. Or anything else Satan would use against me. Lord, with you on my side, I'm going to reach my highest level of development this year. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Every day we must face fear. We're at a war with fear. I don't know about you, though. This month I have decided that my life is going to be defined by the fears I overcome. I'm not going to let my life be defined by, be defined by the fears that overcome me. How many of you are with me? Amen? Amen. Every morning, a phone will be ringing in your life. On one line, fear will be calling you. On the other line, courage is calling. And you will decide which phone to answer. Fear always presents itself. It might be in the form of insecurity, of self-doubt, of worry, of stress. It might be fear of the future, fear of change, fear of an outcome, fear of consequence. But no matter how it presents itself, any time fear shows up, so too does courage. Don't tell me that the millions of people who fought for our country in literal warfare did not have fear. But they fought those fights, how? Because they chose courage over fear. Don't tell me that at some point fear didn't rise up and present itself to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Don't tell me that fear didn't present itself to Joshua and Caleb. We know it did because the other ten spies gave into it. What are, our li what are our lives going to be defined by? Is it going to be defined by the fears that overcame us or defined by courage in the face of fear? Amen? 
the antithesis of the word courage in the literal Greek text in the New, in the New Testament is the word apathy. You know what apathy is, right? Indifference. What's the use? Oh, why bother? Everybody in my family's like this. Oh, you'll never be able to. I mean, that's just our fate. Well, Apathy is, well, you know, it is what it is. Have you ever noticed when people say that, they say it like they're saying something deep? <laughs> well, you know, it is what it is. <laughs> we cannot afford to be apathetic with fear. Just listen to the word. It tells you what it produces. Apathetic. <laughs> Have you ever been around someone that was completely indifferent about their life? Like, hey, man, we've got this opportunity. Let's go for it. Let's do it. Oh, I don't know. I mean, why even bother? I mean, what's the point? I'm not good. I'm not even smart. It's like, I don't know how you are. I, I don't say it all because I've, I've trained myself to actually not say everything I think. It's called maturity, I, I hope. But I don't know, mentally I'm like, I don't have time for you. If, if you want to stay stagnant and stay stuck in your life, fine, but I'm moving on down the road. God's got a hope and a future for me and my family, and I'm not staying here, man. If you want to stay here, fine, but we're going forward. You cannot be apathetic towards the attack of Satan on your life. He is a real enemy and he is seeking whom he may devour. Now, one of the greatest ways he overcomes people is because they won't face him and fight him. And that's why he uses fear because fear tries to decide what is impossible on your behalf. Fear tries to make the decision for your future. So you cannot be complacent with fear. Now here's the good news. When you understand who you are in Christ Jesus and what he has done for you, you understand that your enemy is defeated as long as you will face him with God on your side. He cannot stand against you. So that's why he tries to deceive you into defeating yourself in the face of fear. All right, today we're going to talk about a real fear in society. Proverbs 29, verse 25 says, the fear of who? Who? Man brings a snare. You know, the fear of others is real. It's real. This is a big deal and we need to talk about it. In fact, we're going to talk about it this Sunday and next Sunday. The fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. That word snare means that it puts in our path a moral pitfall. A moral pitfall. The fear of man. The reality is, is we live with people who want us to sit down and to shut up or else. We live with that type of society nowadays with Christianity, but even beyond Christianity. There are people now who, if you do not accept their opinion, they don't want to hear it and will not have respect for an opposing opinion. To me, it's incredibly immature and foolish. I believe that maturity says we can disagree with each other, but still love each other and respect each other. But we're living in a bullying and threatening society. 
and they are bullying and threatening you into submission by using fear. Let's tell the truth today. We as Christians live with people who want us to abandon what we believe. Not just be quiet about it, they want us to abandon it altogether. See it all over the place. You can mock Christianity openly and blatantly and with hatred and judgment. On TV, on social media, in movies, in politics. We have gone years being told not to judge the world, which is right. Jesus says that he didn't come to judge. But the world is pushing so far beyond not judging. See, not judging is I don't place negative condemnation on you based on things that we don't agree with, right? But the world now is taking it so far beyond judging that they want us to certify or to validate sin. And that is not what we're here for as Christians. I can live not judging you, but my judging you doesn't mean I agree. My not judging you, hear me now, definitely does not mean I'm going to participate. My not judging you 100% doesn't believe, d does not include that I'm going to teach my children that certain things are right just because you want me to not judge you. This has been going on since I was a kid. But the voice of these things has gotten more and more powerful now with 24-hour news and, and endless articles and social media, of course. But we're at a place, hear me now, where they, whoever they are, want you to validate what the Bible says is wrong as if it were right. Amen. Hear me now. Next week we'll talk a little bit more about how to handle this, okay? But the enemy is trying to get us to be ruled by fear on a societal level, but even just on a one-on-one -on -one level. I bet all of us has had a person in our lives at some point in our lives where we gave their opinion of us way too much authority. Amen? Here's how it works. The truth is, no one really wants to be excluded. We don't really want to find ourselves in the crossfire. Most people, unless you are an extremist on social media being inflammatory on, for, on purpose for clicks, most people actually don't wake up wanting to offend people. Like, I didn't wake up this morning thinking, you know what, in the 9 a.m. service, I'm going to try to offend at least 100. 
Now in the 1045, that one's bigger. So I'm setting the goal at 200. And in the 1230, I'll be tired by then. I'm going for the whole crowd. <laughs> I mean, give me a break. The majority of society is, is not an extremist. The majority of us, honestly, I believe the majority of us here are just trying to be good people, trying to live a good life, trying to serve God. If you're married, you're probably trying to have a good one, trying to raise good, respect, respectful kids. Want to go to work tomorrow and crush it. Wouldn't mind getting a raise or a promotion at some point. Most people want to live in peace and joy and just be happy. When opportunities arise to make a difference, sure, I'll help you. Great. How many of you are like me? Right? It's like, man, I just want to live my life. I, I, I want to be a great husband, a great dad, a great leader, a good boss. I want to do good. I want to be happy. I want to be at peace. I'm not trying to make people mad. I'm not in my car banging the steering wheel. No, I'm just probably going to go get some ice cream tonight. Most likely I'll eat a little too much. <laughs> you know, trying to keep everything in moderation. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying, right? Like most people just... And all this around us, you're like, oh, does everybody really believe that? But I've investigated the everybody's. You know what I'm talking about, right? Like you'll go into a meeting and somebody's like, everyone's talking. Have you ever looked into the everyone's? I have, because I live in this world. Everyone is saying. I always go like this. Who specifically said it? No, I'm serious. I, 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 who specifically said it? Oh, so many people, Jared. So many people, Jared. <laughs> I've found that big everybody's is two or three people. Usually the so many people is actually literally the one person telling you and they're trying to drum up support for their own fear. It's a famous saying by W.E.B. Du Bois says, it is better to stand tall in a mud puddle than lick the boots in the parlor. It's dangerous to live in a what's in it for me, what about me, I want the spotlight society. We live way too often in fear of them and everyone and all those people. Here's the question. Am, are we willing to live in a world or live a life run by and intimidated by bullies and cowards? I don't know about you, but I'm not really willing to live that way. I'm telling you, if... If we responded to all the everyone's and all the negativity and all the attacks on our church and we responded with what they wanted us to do, we would not be here today. Amen. We would literally not have a church. We would not have a backpack giveaway. I, a month from now, when we post pictures online of the backpack and shoe giveaway, read the comments. They won't all be positive. How do you find something negative to say about a group of people that raised money to go help kids go back to school with new backpacks, shoes, and supplies when otherwise they wouldn't be able to get them? How do you not like that? 
I've told you in the past, of everything we do as a church, the thing that gets the most negative comments, the toy and food giveaway in San Eli. How, how do you get mad that we feed people in a part of our region that everybody knows in some areas of it has, ex has real extreme need? Not all of it, but some. How do you get mad that we go at Christmas and take them boxes of food and give the kids toys. Like, what's going on in your heart there? You know what I'm saying? Like some of it I understand, fine. If, if you don't wanna, you know, believe in, in, in large gatherings of church, fine. But like, helping kids at Christmas? If we responded to all the thems and the theys and the everyones, we wouldn't even have a church. Amen? Amen. You know, our, our lives are short. They don't always feel short, but they are. Compared to eternity, our lives are pretty short. In fact, God calls our lives on earth but a vapor. So the question is, how are you gonna spend your time on earth? Are you gonna spend it afraid, intimidated, scared? Or are you gonna spend your time on earth full of faith, involved, making a difference, and taking a stand for what's right? The choice is ours. Matthew 16, verse 24, Jesus speaking. He says, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now this has been taught hundreds of different ways, but let me give you one definition of the phrase, take up his cross. A lot of people teach it as if you have to put on a burden. No, that's not what it's saying. In the Greek text, it says to take a stand. To take a stand. See, our society, our families, our churches, and above all, our God needs people who are willing to take a stand. Can I get a better amen than that? Amen. Our families need parents who will take a stand. Our city needs people who will take a stand. Our church needs people who will take a stand for what is right and not live lives of compromise and fear. Your children need you. You are their example. You are their future. Our God needs people who will take a stand. And let me say this, it's worth it. God is worth taking a stand for. Your marriage is worth taking a stand for. Come on, can, can somebody talk to me this morning? Your children are worth taking a stand for. Your physical, mental, emotional well-being and future is worth taking a stand for. Your kids and raising them right and protecting what they watch, listen to, and are told to believe is worth taking a stand for. Amen. It doesn't mean you're out picking fights with everybody. No, it means in your house, you are controlling what is taught as right and wrong, and what we are watching and listening to. Man, I walked in the room the other day, 
And my daughter has a vivid imagination, meaning that her dreams are way more than fighting Gollum in the house. <laughs> we have lots of waking up at three in the morning. I'm just being honest with you. And I walked in and she had on a movie and it was like, you know, a little scary. And I was like, mm-mm-mm. Turn it off. But dad, dad is nothing. Turn it off. Oh my God. I'm just saying there. Let me ask you a question. Who do you think wins arguments between Jared and the two kids? We, we, have, we have a rule in the house. If dad said it once, that's what it's gonna be. You know what I'm saying? Like, you can, you can roll on the floor and weep and cry, it doesn't matter. I just, uh... are you done yet? I'll tell him this, you got about three seconds before you lose your iPad before you lose your gaming station. You wanna keep putting on this show, go for it. I don't care, I already told you to change the channel. Like, it's the way it's gonna be, man. It's my job, it is my job to protect those kids. When they're 18 years old, they can go get a job and do whatever they want. But they will not blame bad decisions on me. If they want to make other decisions, like I went years making decisions. I never once blamed them on my parents. I was making my own choices during those decisions. It wasn't my parents' fault. I knew what was right. Amen. How many of you love movies? I love movies. I love them. Um, who do we remember in the, in the movie? Good action movie? Who do we remember? We remember the hero. Right? Rocky. Who cares about, who was the Russian guy? Uh, Drago. Is that his name, right? Can I barely even remember him. Right, we're gonna all go see Mission Impossible. Right, like, we remember Maverick. You know who I'm talking about, right? We remember the hero, not the coward. You know that you can be the hero of your life. And maybe you'll never have a movie, maybe never, no one will ever post about you, but your kids will remember you. Your husband will remember you. Your wife will remember. The pe you can be the hero of your own life. But what do all the heroes have in common? Fear showed up, and they faced fear with courage. What else do heroes have in common? They are not ruled by the opinions of people around them. See, heroes live with conviction. Heroes live with a sense of purpose. Heroes do what's right because it's the right thing to do. Heroes do not live compromised. Heroes do not change from right to wrong because someone around them is going to reject them because of their stance on what is right. Carla and I have been getting rejected by the world around us since we got married. We find out about the parties and the gatherings and the dinners that all of our friends, go, uh, friends get invited to that we don't get invited to. That's fine. Thank you for the respect of not inviting me. It's fine, because they know that we don't live in certain participating in certain things that they want to participate in, so please, don't invite me. I'm cool with that. I didn't get married to friends. I got married to Carla. 
And if I'm going to spend Friday nights with anybody, I'm going to spend it with her and my two little kids. And sometimes I'm going to get a babysitter and only spend it with Carla. <laughs> it's fine. But I'd much rather have a godly, healthy marriage and raise godly, healthy kids than live a life of compromise. The fear of man brings a snare, a moral pitfall. Who is going to decide your future? Are you going to decide it or are they going to decide it? See, some of you know this is real. Some of you wouldn't be here this morning if you didn't face the thems in your life. Some of you, when you started coming here, you got mocked by people. Some of you, when you started realizing, man, the way I've been living is what's been causing me to be so upset and frustrated. I gotta, I gotta change the way I'm living. And you started climbing out of that life. People tried to pull you back in. People will mock you for giving 40 bucks to buy a backpack, but they won't mock you spending 200 at a bar. And they're telling you that I'm manipulating you Who's manipulating you? The bar. They really are only after your money. They mock you. See, the hero steps out in faith. The hero confronts the wrongs in their own life and changes them. See, society thinks that heroes confront the wrongs of other people. No, the real heroes just take a look at their own life. Jesus called, said, don't point out the speck in your brother's eye. Why? Because most of us have a plank in our own. Usually it's the hypocrites pointing out other people's wrongs. See, heroes step out in faith without guarantees of success. You know, at times life is risky. Man, when you start going through a season of change and you're kind of like walking out into the unknown, getting out of your comfort zone, God's taking you into a new thing. I mean, that, there, there's moments there, it's scary. Am I right? Man, when you take a stand on certain behavioral choices in your life, certain lifestyle choices that maybe you're changing even from your past, you don't know what the outcome's gonna be. See, but... Heroes step out in faith and purpose regardless of the outcome. Fear causes you to not even take the step. And it's real. Man, I remember one day I was over at the West Side Church. It was about three months until completion. And I mean, I had like a moment of panic. And I thought to myself, oh my God. What if nobody shows up? <laughs> I was like, this will bankrupt. This will be the end of the church. I mean, we kind of figured somebody would show up. You kind of assumed, but you didn't have a guarantee. I kind of, I almost had the same moment a couple weeks ago. I went to the downtown church and I was like, oh my God, what if nobody shows up? <sighs> what are people going to think about me? What are they going to say about me? They know that I like championed this and nobody, what if nobody shows up?
Well, if you want a guarantee in life about everything, you're not going to ever do anything. There's no guarantee in marriage. There's no guarantee in business. Some of you, there's a bunch of entrepreneurs in here. You didn't have 500 clients the day you went downtown and registered your business. You had an idea. Maybe you had a buddy that was like, yeah, call me when you get figured out. No, you had an idea. If you're going to be ruled by fear of outcome, then you're never going to do anything. Sometimes you just got to go for it. Amen? Are you going to decide your future or are you going to let the world decide it for you? There are, hear me now, there are worse things in life than being criticized or excluded. You want to know what they are? Living a compromised life with people who don't love you for who you are. The fear of man, it wants you to compromise who you really are for acceptance. But is that really a relationship? Is that a relationship when someone won't love you for who you are? And what you believe and what you stand for, what your dreams are? Fear always robs us of opportunity, of idea. And the fear of man causes us to live lives ruled by others. But when we choose courage and faith, hear me now, we are choosing to take back control of our lives. But upon doing so, you are rejecting the lie of a safe life. But a safe life is actually not that safe. It's a selfish life. It's a self-preservation life. Here's the truth. Being on the good side of bad people does not produce a good life. Being on the good side of ungodly people does not produce a godly life. John 16, 33. Jesus speaking. These things I've spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you'll have tribulation. Be of good cheer. I told you last week that means take courage. I've overcome the world. At times life is risky. And it requires courage. Who do we name our kids after? We name our kids after people that had courage. Am I right? You know, there was 12 spies. We name our kids after two of them. We don't even remember the other 10 names. The 10 that had fear. The 10 that didn't want to go into the promised land. No, no, no. There are men in this room named Joshua and Caleb after the two that wanted to go into the promised land and ultimately did. We name our kids after Peter, James, and John. We name our kids after Stephen and Paul. We have holidays for men and women that stood in the face of fear and in the face of society trying to tear them down and they stood for what they believed in and stood for what was right. Who are we going to be? If we put the opinion of others as our priority, we subject our lives to their control. What we should do is put God's opinion as our priority and everyone else's opinion is subject to his opinion. Amen? Amen? 
Let's live for God. And like the scripture said, the fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. Let's not be ruled by the opinions of others. Let's be ruled by the opinion of God. Because man, at the end of all our days, we're going to be standing before him. And I would rather be courageous and bold in my faith and convictions with my wife, with my kids, and with my church than worry about the opinion of someone that no matter what I do, it won't change their opinion anyway. You know, I wrote out this confession. We're gonna put it up here on the screen. In a moment, we're gonna confess this as a church family, but uh, get your phones out. Take a picture of this. Everybody, come on. So, what I, what I want, I'm doing this for two reasons. I want you to get a picture of it because when fear tries to show up in a few weeks, I want you to have this in, in your albums so you can confess this. But secondly, today, I wanna flood social media with this. I mean, the world's flooding it with everything else. Am I right? So I want everybody to post this, tag me, I'll repost you. And let's let this flood, amen? Amen, okay, let's confess this together on the count of three. One, two, three. I believe God is and with me. Okay, stop, 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 stop. <laughs> Didn't we talk about this a few minutes ago? I believe God is for me. I will live bold in my faith. Now, come on. You know what? No, let's not do it. Okay. Let's just try again. Okay? Okay. Are we ready? Are we excited? Okay. We're cool? Okay. On the count of three. I'll, I'll do one line and this, you, you, okay, I'll do it by myself. This is the, okay. I believe God is for me and with me. Like that. Okay? All right. One, two, three. I would live bold in my faith and not afraid of my future. Okay, pause. Let's say that again. God has something great in store for me and my family. One more time. God has something great in store for me and my family. Say amen to that. Amen. amen. Let's keep going. No matter what I see, no matter what I hear, no matter what I face, my trust is in the Lord. He is my protector and my counselor. Okay, pause. Now we're gonna get into the Rochelle Neiman confession, okay? Here we go. Some of you remember her saying this. I remember this every night before going to bed. Let's say it because God said it about our lives. If God be for me, who can be against me? I am courageous and not afraid. I am a winner and not a loser. I am victorious and not defeated. I am a believer and not a doubter. Ooh I let, see some, some of you still need some convincing though because the truth is, is not everybody was raised with, with a mom like my mom. And some of you were raised with people actually pouring the opposite of this into your life. See, some of you were taught to believe that you would never get ahead, that you weren't good enough, that you weren't smart enough, that, well, this is just as good as it gets for our family. And maybe even you're sitting here and you're not even sure to believe me yet, but 
I want to tell you this, you've got to at least start changing your confession. So we're going to start right there at the last part, I am courageous. And let's just say that again as a church family, okay? Count of three. One, two, three. I am courageous and not afraid. I am a winner and not a loser. I am victorious and not defeated. I am a believer and not a doubter. One more time. I am courageous and not afraid. I am a winner and not a loser. I am victorious and not defeated. I am a believer and not a doubter. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Man, I'm telling you, if you struggle with fear, you start confessing this every morning when you wake up, and you confess this every night before you go to bed. Get your phone out. Let that be the last thing that gets into your spirit before you lay your head down. Amen? Amen. Amen. Bow your heads, close your eyes. Maybe you're here today, you don't have a relationship with the Lord. You can, you should, you need to. I want to give you an opportunity to make Jesus Lord and Savior of your life. I want to give you the opportunity to know that you're going to go to heaven, that your sins are forgiven, that your past is washed away, to know that you're leaving here and God is leaving with you and he's leaving with your best interest in mind. If you've never made Jesus Lord and Savior of your life, I implore you to do so today. Or maybe you used to have a relationship with God, but for whatever reason, you disconnected from him. I want to give you the opportunity to come back to God today, to reestablish your connection with him, to get right with, with him. Excuse me. I'm going to lead the church to what we call the prayer of salvation. And I want to invite you to pray it with us. Whether it's for the first time or the 10th time, the time does not matter. The only thing that matters is that you do this. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to count to three. And if you'd say to me, Jared, I, I want to pray. I want to go to heaven. I want my sins forgiven. I want to make Jesus Lord and Savior of my life. Or you'd say to me, Jared, I just need to get right with God. I need to come back to God. I need to reconnect with God. I need to reestablish Jesus as my priority. If you want to be included in this prayer on the count of three, raise your hand up. There's going to be quite a few of you because you know you need to. On the count of three. One, two, three. Come on, raise them up. Yes, thank you, thank you. Keep them up for a moment. Whole family over here to my left. God bless y'all. Hands all over the room. Our usher's gonna give you a little card. I'll explain that in a moment. Let's pray as a church family. Say this. Say, Heavenly Father, give you my life. Give you my heart and my soul. I make Jesus my Lord and Savior. Forgive my sins. Put my past behind me. In Jesus' name. Amen. As we stand to our feet, let's welcome these people to the family of God. You're going to heaven. We gave you a little card that talks about following Jesus. We'd love for you to get the corresponding book that goes with it at the Connect Center. It's our gift to you. Please go get it and come back to church. God bless you. Love you. Go live a bold life. Go be the hero of your family. Amen. We're going to continue this next Sunday. Next Sunday is even better than today. It's awesome. I've already done the outline. It's spectacular. See you next week. Have a great week. Go live for God.